Hello everyone. Here we are with PC13, the new photo challenge for this month and perhaps even longer than a month because it's going to be pretty deep. We're going to continue on the theme of abstraction because I really was impressed with the photos that were that have been posted over the last uh, few weeks. They've been really good, I thought, just taking the ideas and really uh, making it your own. So I wanted to continue along the theme of abstraction. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to discuss how we can use blur as an element of creative abstraction. Because usually when you think of blur, it's something to be avoided, right? You know, we, we take pictures and if we're not using proper technique and we're moving the camera a little bit. You know, we get a blurry picture, we don't like it, we delete it. But blur can actually be a pretty good thing if it's used imaginatively and with intention. Now, I was going to present this by showing you my PowerPoint presentation, which I've done, I guess, the last two or three videos. And unfortunately, for technical reasons that are really escaping me, I don't know why it doesn't want to work for me. So unfortunately, I'm going back to the way I did my original videos, where you unfortunately have to look at me uh, as I speak, but I'll have the photos uh, posted together with this video so you can see what I'm referring to. So I'm going to uh, periodically check here just to see where I'm at in, in the scheme of things. But um, the idea here is to avoid um, you know, using a lot of apps in Photoshop. You know, th there's a way of getting Photoshop for free just by being creative. Again, nothing wrong with those things, but um, there are things you can do in your camera or just with your own body, believe it or not, that can actually affect... Uh, how you can come up with a really interesting abstract image. Uh, I'm, the images that I'm going to present here are going to show you different degrees of blur. So it can be from something very subtle uh, to something very extreme. Uh, so there's a whole range that you can play with. Uh, the other thing too is, uh, as far as the technique goes, there are basically two broad categories. So to get blur into your picture in a creative way, what you have to be aware of is that there has to be some motion blur going on. In other words, something somewhere has to be moving. Either it's a photographer who's moving, or it's a subject of the picture that's moving, or it might not even be the subject. It might be something in the background that's actually moving that creates this, um, you know, this blur. Now, you can also do it after the fact. You can have a picture that's taken that's sharp, and then you can impose blur afterwards. Uh, and that can be done uh, artificially with, obviously, with apps, uh, with Photoshop. But there are also things you can do with your lens that I'll cover that can also, um, that can do that after the fact. <laughs> all right, I'll leave it there for now. We'll get into it more later. I don't want to give it all away. Um, so the natural motion uh, blur that, that I talked about, uh, there's a picture that I'm going to post. They're going to be numbered. So picture number one you're going to see are these uh, purple flowers. And what happened was I was doing an experiment. Uh, what I did was I literally uh, literally spun around like a pirouette, the way a ballerina would do it, only obviously a lot more clumsy. <laughs> but by spinning around, I would stop suddenly, and then I would just snap the picture at whatever happened to be in front of the camera. And in this case, it happened to be these flowers. And as you'll see, uh, these flowers have a nice blur to them. There's also a very creamy background. And this was not done in Photoshop. This picture is straight out of the camera. And it was just because I was spinning around. Uh, picture number two, you'll see are of these leaves. Uh, same technique. I just spun around, stopped, snapped the shutter. That's what happened to, uh, to be in front of the lens. And these leaves look almost like it's a graphic. You know, it looks almost like it's drawn or, or something. And, and again, it's not. It's just the colors, everything was all straight out of the camera. So you can get some pretty uh, impressive results just by moving yourself. That's all you have to do. The other thing is um, photographing things that are in motion. So you're still, or relatively still, but your subject is moving. So uh, picture number three, and I may, be losing, I may lose count here, but picture number three is going to be of this lady dressed up as a witch. It was during Halloween. And uh, I post this because, you know, when we take, we, with today's cameras, okay, especially a DSLR, the sensors are so good and the lenses are so well made now that you can get an incredible level of detail in your pictures. 
I, I've taken portraits of people where you can see the pores of their skin. You can see um, you can see the makeup, you know, the uneven texture of the makeup, with the way it was applied, like the bumps and all that, you know, stray hairs and things like that. We don't always have to see all that, you know. A good picture is not necessarily a tack sharp one. Uh, certainly, uh, a lot of the women I photograph would prefer that I not photograph every pore in their body or every little, you know, little line in their face. So, introducing a little bit of blur can actually be very flattering to the subject, and you'll see that in this particular photo. Now, it's not that this uh, woman was hideous or anything like that, but there is something very, um, you know, very soft, and it almost gives you like a feeling. So, it's just another way of thinking about taking pictures. They don't always have to be tack sharp. I, I've seen, uh, I've read forums where people obsess over the degree of clarity in their lenses, and I, I think it's, um, I think it, I think their energies are being misspent on that sort of thing. Uh, the picture that follows that is one of a bird that is also pretty blurry. Uh, the bird I had intended to photograph the bird so it would be sharp. In fact, you can even see where it was because there's a little there's some leaves in the in the middle towards the top. That's where the bird was located, and um, the bird moved from that spot. But it created an image that I didn't intend. In fact, uh, all these pictures I'm showing now are of blur that was unintended but ended up being uh, a happy accident if you will because it gave this blur kind of it gave this bird kind of a dreamy feel to it you'll see that the leaves off to the right are really blurry and the ones above it are really sharp uh, also the composition is kind of unusual and it's just a different way of photographing an animal that is probably been photographed the same way hundreds of times uh, the follow the photo that follows is of a kid dancing on the street. Now, if I had gotten this picture sharp, right, which some people think is the right way of taking a picture, I think it would have been less interesting because you wouldn't even know what he was doing. He'd just be holding his hands off to the side and like, well, what's going on there? But because he moved very quickly with his arms, you'll see that they are in motion. And what it does is it creates um, some movement to the picture. Uh, the picture that follows is, is similar. It's a, a dancer flipping over he looks like a rag doll, and his face is pretty much blurry, and his uh, left arm in particular is blurry. But what it does is, again, it, it kind of propels you along with him. And what it does is it creates an energy. It creates a life to the picture, because photographs by their nature, unlike film, are static. So this is a way of adding a dimension to your picture. Uh, same thing with this other one that follows of this, uh, this guy dressed up like a baby, and he's holding maracas. Now, again, if I had taken the picture where I captured it and froze the action, you would just see him holding maracas. Uh, that's the information that would be conveyed. It'd be like he was standing for a portrait. But because he was moving fast enough where he introduced blur, now we know that he was actually shaking and playing the maracas. So what it does is it gives you more information. So it's interesting, right, that uh, degrading a photo, right, making it less sharp, can actually uh, convey more information than a perfectly shot frozen picture, right? So think about that. Um, there's a photo you'll see of a train going by, and I, I put that there because uh, the motion doesn't always just have to be the, um, you know, the subject. It can also be what's behind the subject. So think about that too. In this case, the fellow with the backpack is uh, pretty sharp, but the train was moving very fast. Again, if I had taken this and frozen the action, you wouldn't know. Is the train uh, stationary and people are boarding it or about to board it, or is the train actually arriving? You know, what's going on? So this is a way of presenting more information, creates a more interesting image because of the streaks off to the left. So um, in this case, um, I was stationary. The subject was stationary, the fellow with the backpack, the background, the train was moving. All right, let's talk about obvious blur. So it's a little bit more extreme, but now we're combining elements. So everything I've talked about but, uh, you know, thus far, those things can be combined so that you have uh, more interesting types of blur and more interesting kinds of abstraction. So there's a fellow here with glasses and he's pretty much in focus. He's a little soft, he's a little blurry, because he was moving a little bit, and I may have been moving a little bit. But you'll see that surrounding him 
is a swirl of activity from the crowd that he was uh, centered in, right? So those swirls, especially off to the left, they're kind of horizontal swirls, almost like water. Uh, that was created by the motion of the crowd, but I also slowed the shutter of my camera to accentuate and make those uh, patterns of movement even flowier, if there's such a word. But there's more to it than that, okay? The crowd was moving, the subject was still, I was more or less still, but what I did was I jerked the camera, uh, I believe it was downward. I jerked it downward, and by doing so, you get these, uh, these streaks up on the top of the picture. So now you have a horizontal and vertical uh, streaks of blur. And again, it creates more interest in the image. It, it makes it something very unique and very painterly also. I'll talk in a, in a little bit about uh, shutter speeds and, and how to set them. Um, let's see what else I got here. Okay, there's one of this fellow on a bike. All right, you'll see that also posted up here. The fellow on the bike, you'll see, um, you'll see there's a lot of motion that's conveyed in the image. What happened here was when I saw him dri oh, driving, riding by, uh, I trained my camera on him, got him in, his focus, in as much focus as I could, and then I pan my camera with him, you see? So he's moving and I'm moving. And I'm trying to maintain more or less the same speed. If you look at the picture closely, you'll see that um, you know there's some blur in the wheels and all that. So it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't meant to be. What was more important was that by doing that, the background streaked by in my image. And so what it does is it creates this impression of speed. It's almost as if we're riding alongside him and, uh, and we're seeing the background kind of going past us. So it takes an ordinary image of a person on a bike and it gives it a, a sense of motion. Let's see what else we got here. By the way, what I would recommend, if you want to, if you really want to, because I, I would recommend that you watch this video more than once because it's, there's more to it than I think uh, I might be letting on because I'm trying to go through it quickly although it's probably going to be about half an hour by the time I'm done. But I would recommend that you actually download the photos, which you, you can do on, um, on Facebook. And this way you can open them up, uh, especially if you're on a computer, you can open them up, and then you can uh, minimize the screen to watch the video, and then you can see the pictures that I'm referring to. Because uh, I would recommend that you see the pictures large, maybe even zoom, zoom in on them, so you can really appreciate what's going on as far as the blur and the, and, and the relationship between the planes of focus that are clear and those that are um, blurry. But anyway, uh, there's a picture of this fellow. Um, he looks almost like a double exposure, right? Because he, you'll see there's two images of him and one's above the other. The reason for that is because it's not a double exposure, but what was happening was I was walking very fast. And when I walk very fast, I tend to kind of bop up and down, right? So you can actually see the camera going up and down with me. That's what gives you that double exposure uh, appearance. But I also slowed the shutter speed of my camera down. And by doing so, these light bulbs that were under this marquee of a hotel that he, this fellow was walking by start taking on the same shape as my, uh, as my walking. And that's what gives you those squiggly, swirly lines. So um, again, very, some very interesting results that can be achieved just by slowing your shutter down and being aware of your own motion and your subject's motion. Now, as far as doing this artificially, um, there is a, uh, I won't get into it too deeply, um, but because it's not my purpose to show you how to use this particular lens I'm gonna talk about, it's called a tilt shift lens. I just want you to be aware that it exists. Tilt shift lenses are typically used when you're photographing architecture. If you take a picture of a, of a skyscraper, for instance, and you point up, you know, you'll see that the uh, building starts to splay outwards, what's called parallax. And there's software that can straighten that out for you. But before there was software, there were special lenses that actually did the straightening out in camera. That principle where the, uh, where the, shift, where, where the lens shifts and tilts is something that's employed in a, in, a, in a lens made by a company called Lens Baby, all right? And uh, you'll see from the photo that I'll post that the lens is actually mounted on a, on a ball, like a ball bearing sort of, and so you can pivot the lens. You can move it around. 
Now the, the lens creates blur, but not because you're moving the, the lens at, while you're taking the picture. What happens is you move the lens where you want it, you leave it there, then you take your picture. And what's happening is depending on where you pivot that lens, that's where your uh, blur is being placed. And then again, not to get into it, not to get into it too deeply, but there are these aperture rings you can pop in, and those aperture rings will determine how much blur is being placed in those locations. So the best thing is to just look at an actual example, and you'll see there's one of a friend of mine. Uh, we used to do uh, music concerts together. I photographed him over at Weir Farm, and he's in motion a little bit. He's strumming the guitar, and he's and he's kind of you know lost in the in, in the song. But if you look at it closely, you'll see there are different planes of, of blur, and that's created by this lens. And it's something that's not easily easily replicable in Photoshop or in an app or, or really any other way because you'll have different planes, whereas typically with a lens, you'll have focus either in the front, right, or blur in the front, right, in the foreground, and maybe uh, some blur in the back, right, behind the subject. That's what we refer to as depth of field. But here you're going to have uh, different planes of that, which will be more apparent in this next picture of this landscape. This was a landscape I shot for the Park Service over in Boston. And you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a lot of blur, because that's where I tilted the lens. I wanted to place the blur there. But if you move horizontally from the left to the right, you'll see that the blur uh, becomes a little bit less extreme. You, you don't see as many streaks. Uh, if you look at the back, you'll see it's uh, you'll see there's a sailboat that's pretty sharp, and then right in, and again if you move horizontally to the right, you'll see some other um, sailboats that are really really blurry. So it's really interesting the, the way the planes of focus work. And again, you can't really get this in Photoshop. Uh, you can with a lot of work, but it's so much easier with the lens baby lens, and it's never gonna be the same thing as the actual lens. This is all done in camera. There's no uh, processing afterwards. So again, just wanted you to be aware of it. Uh, the photo that follows is a pretty well-known photo, actually. I, I took it for the Park Service. It's of a slave cemetery. It's been exhibited in many museums and also been published in many newspapers. But uh, this was a photo uh, of a slave cemetery where I, I felt a certain emotional response to what I was seeing that I thought was very profound and I wanted to convey that in the image. So you'll see that the cross on the right side is pretty sharp. You can actually read the name of the slave that's buried under there, or believed to be buried under there. And then off to the right is another cross, and that one almost looks like it's almost looks like a ghost, right? Almost like it's moving and vibrating. And you get that same sensation with the background. It's also very uh, vague and kind of painterly and swirly and dreamy and kind of vibrating. But then off to the left, you get some clarity. So again, that's done with that lens, and it's a very unique uh, effect. All, the original photo uh, was color, and, and but it was blurry. And all I did was just convert it to black and white. So that's all that was done there. All right, distorting your lens. Um, as I mentioned, another way is to do things with your lens. You can distort your lens. Some are ways that I don't recommend, uh, but I just want you to be aware of them. Uh, I'm not a Doris Day fan in particular, but I've seen some of her movies or, or portions of it when I channel surf. And I saw one where in one scene she was very sharp and in focus. And then in the next scene it was a close-up and she was all blurry and kind of glamoury looking. And I'm wondering like, what's going on there? So I did a little research on it. And I don't know how accurate this research is. It wasn't like I did a deep dive into it. But from what I read, she was very... Um, uh, you know, very vain about her appearance. So they were doing a close-up. She insisted that those close-ups close be blurry so you don't see too many details in her face. And one of the ways they supposedly did this was like putting a little bit of Vaseline on the lens. That's why I, I don't recommend it. Uh, although I might do it on my smartphone because that, that'll be easy to remove. But, um, but apparently that's what they did. So Vaseline is kind of one way. Uh, they might have used a screen or some other thing to achieve the same effect. Another thing you can do, well, you could do it. I don't recommend it, although I have done it, and that is to actually disconnect your lens from your camera, and then just holding it in front of the, uh, holding it in front of the can camera body where the hole is. Now I'm laughing because I did this. You'll see in a picture I took of this um, of this lighthouse in Cape May, New Jersey, 
And I was out on the beach where there's sand and there's moisture and there's wind and stuff is blowing around. So, you know, not the best thing to do because you don't want that stuff getting into your camera. But this uh, picture, other than converting it to black and white, is straight out of the camera. I, I didn't even bother, you know, cleaning, cleaning it up. You'll see there's a, um, a, little, uh, a little bit of dust on the sensor off to the right of the uh, lighthouse. And you'll see some dark specks, which are probably detritus that was blowing around in the wind. But I wanted to see what it looked like. And, and so there you go. That's an example of what happens when you disconnect your lens from the, uh, from the camera body. Uh, another way that you can do it, which, which I do recommend because it's very easy to do and it's very safe, is to simply get a plastic baggie, like the ones you use for your sandwiches. You can put the baggie over your lens, or in the case of the photo you'll see of this child with his mom or his aunt or somebody, grandma. Um, I actually put the entire smartphone in the bag, and I took the picture that way. And so the bag ended up distorting, and it gives you this very nice, uh, very soft feel. It almost looks like it was taken with a pinhole camera. So it's a very interesting effect. It's free Photoshop. There's a picture that follows of a, of a traffic cop, also with the same effect, very, very distorted, very blurry, uh, but very moody at the same time. And it's all just done with a Ziploc bag. Now, um, there's another picture I'm going to post up to show you um, the, the whole shutter speed thing, right? So some of you may not have much experience with shutter speeds, but ultimately it's something you're gonna have to check your camera manual on. So if you have a DSLR or point and shoot, check your camera manual on how you can adjust your, um, your uh, shutter speed. Uh, but also with your uh, smartphone, you can change your shutter speed. It just depends on what phone you have and, and all that sort of thing. It's, again, beyond the scope of this video for me to get into the specific steps, but I have a screenshot that you'll see of the uh, from an Android phone. And so certain Android phones, I don't know which particular model this was or what operating software it had, but I just wanted you to see what to look for. What you want to look for is what the arrow that I put in, that, that arrow is not part of the screenshot. I added that arrow to show you what to look for, which are the fractions, okay? The fractions define... Uh, the speed of the shutter. So in the case of this um, uh, screenshot, it's one three thousand. I don't even know how to say it. One thirty two hundredth, <laughs> whatever that is. It's very fast. That's what it's doing. So that's going to freeze action. Uh, I find that if I lower my shutter speed to one over thirty, right? So it's one slash thirty, one thirtieth of a second. Um, that starts to slow things up enough where you start seeing some blur. And obviously, you know, you can slow it up even more and you can go back and forth. It's something you're gonna have to experiment with because um, I can't give you specific shutter speed settings to get the results that I've showed you so far because there's too many variables involved. It's not just the shutter speed, but it's also, am I moving? Is the subject moving? Is the background moving? Are we all moving? Uh, how fast are we moving? I may be going faster, they may be going slower. So there's lots of variables that that interact that give you these results. But that's also the beauty of it. The beauty of it is that it requires a great deal of experimentation and trial and error. And that's where the creativity comes in. Sometimes you get some very interesting results you never expected. And also the more you do it, the more you become familiar with your particular camera. And after a while you start developing a, uh, you know, sort of an instinct for where you need to set things in relation to what's in motion. So that's what that's all about. Now, if your camera doesn't have that function, there are apps you can download that will provide that function. And it also depends on your camera. I mean, my smartphone is, uh, is an iPhone 7, which by today's standards is pretty old. I think they're up to 12 now, iPhone 12. So perhaps the newer iPhones uh, you can adjust the shutter speed, but certainly as of the iPhone 7, you could not do that. Uh, if you have an iPhone, so Android people, you might find this a little boring, but you should listen to it anyway. It's just good to know. On the, on the, um, on the iPhone 7 in particular, uh, you'll see that there is a live function. So when you're taking a picture on the top, you'll see a little button that says live. If you tap that, it turns yellow. And what it does is it takes a picture that's actually a little mini video. It's, um, I don't even think it's more than two seconds. It's really quick. So when you see the picture, you see a little bit of motion. But when you take that photo, 
If you swipe up on the photo, you will get some options on the bottom. And if you scroll around, you'll see one that says long exposure. I'll put up a picture on that too. You'll see it says long exposure. If you tap that, what it does is it pulls stills from the video, creates a composite, and creates this artificial long exposure. So it's taking a, you know, what, what was a, a clear shot and imposing blur in a creative way. So I have some examples there. You'll see there's one of a lady uh, in white. She's still. And then in front of her, you'll see this, uh, this cloud of yellow going by her. And what that was was a group of people, a bunch of tourists with some yellow slickers on because it was rainy. And as they walked by, uh, they become this cloud of yellow from that live effect that's on, photo, uh, that's on the iPhone 7 and probably some other versions of the iPhone. Uh, the picture that follows that is the same technique. Uh, here all you see are the shoes, the footwear, the people walking by, and their bodies just become wisps of smoke as they go by. Uh, the picture that follows that uh, is just showing you how, how far you can get with blur, where it becomes almost a total abstraction. You can barely make out what's there. So here you'll see uh, there's a group of guys with some placards, and, and they're pretty blurry. You know, it, it's done with that iPhone setting. The one that follows that shows you that it's even in black and white, it looks pretty good. I happen to love this one because it almost looks like a charcoal drawing. Not to suggest that charcoal drawings are better than photos. I think photos uh, should be independent of what um, the graphic arts are. They stand on their own. But I like it because it's interesting how the blurring effect gives you this texture and this feel. It's very vibrant. Uh, you can see him in his plaid jacket and then you have this uh, crowd in front of him that's, you kind of get the sense of they're moving. Uh, the one that follows that is a crowd, really, really blurry, so they were moving quite a bit. And it's almost not even about the crowd, it's more about the colors and the shapes. And the one that follows that, the final one, again, it's so abstract, it's more just an impression. It becomes very impressionistic in that way. So that's pretty much it, but it's a lot. So again, I recommend you watch the video more than once and really give it some thought, really absorb it. Uh, I would suggest you try all the techniques. So try one where you create an image that's abstract and introduces some blur, where you're moving. Try one where the subject is moving. Try one where the background is moving. Uh, try one with a plastic bag. Try one with your DSLR, your point and shoot, your, um, you know, with your smartphone. Try one with emotions very fast and very slow. Try these different things. I, I think if you do that, you're going to get some results you never would have gotten otherwise. And when you post them up, make sure to use the hashtag, which looks like a little tic-tac-toe, and make it PC13, all right? So we can find those images. If you have questions, uh, feel free to post them. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can on them. Or if some, one, one of you know the answer, then help out the other person. Uh, make sure to like the pictures too. That's why that like button is there. It's very easy. It's encouraging for people to see that their pictures are being uh, liked. Um, I like to I like to click like to at least let them know that I saw the picture. So you know that doesn't mean if I hate it, I'm going to click like so you know that I saw it. But but the point is, we like getting the affirmation, right? That's what it's about. So I encourage you to click the like button if you um, have a comment, a question. Uh, I would encourage you to post that too, or just a word of encouragement. You have, you have the time to type something in there. If you know folks who might be interested in this uh, group, then I encourage you to invite them. I mean, look, my original intention was to do workshops, right? I mean, that's how this began. I was doing the workshops. I thought I would do the group as a way to have people continue learning and to have a, a place where they can post their pictures. Uh, obviously, because of this pandemic, that wasn't the case last year. And as far as this year goes, who knows, right? So it's going to be tough going. Um, it's hard for me to, to, uh, to get into some of these topics through a video. Uh, I prefer to do it in a classroom setting where I can show you the pictures in real time and, and I can take specific questions. So I hope these videos are, are, are helpful to you. Uh, if they're not, uh, please tell me. I actually want to know because... You know, I just won't do them anymore. I'll do something else. 
but I, I hope they're helpful. I, I hope you, you find that you're improving in your photography. I, I think you are because I've been looking at them and I see a lot of uh, progress just over the, the time this group has been in existence. So without further ado, I encourage you to get busy. I'm posting this up on a Saturday, so tomorrow or Sunday. So you have a whole day, to, if you're off on Sunday, to, to mess around with your camera and show us all what you've got to offer. Okay, so get busy, and I will see you soon.